Hello, Houston. How are you? It's Mr. McKinney here with Mr. McKinney's Historic Houston. Excited for the live show we do every single first Wednesday of the month here at the Heritage Society. Tonight's installment, we're going to introduce you to Dr. Jesse Esparza. We're going to talk about the history of the Mexican and Mexican experience here in Houston. This is an exciting opportunity to celebrate and, uh, and, and learn more about this great community that helped shape our region. Looking forward to this. Like we always do before we start our show, make sure we introduce Allison Ayers-Bell, who is the Executive Director for the Heritage Society. Allison is going to tell you about all the great things that are happening here at the Heritage Society, which has been around since 1954, preserving and promoting Houston's past and their history. All right. Say hello, Allison. Welcome. Hello. Hello. All How right. It's a pleasure to have you back. Uh, and, and tell us what's going on at the Heritage Society. Sure. Well, this, uh, for, oh, here we go. This Friday is our big gala called Natsuo, which is Houston spelled backwards. It's a resurrection of a gala they had back at the turn of the century, um, sort of New Orleans style. We're very excited. It's going to be at the ballroom at Bayou Place, and uh, we are going to have dis socially distant spread out tables. It's a 10,000 square foot ballroom, so we'll have plenty of uh, space to spread out, and we have lots of exciting auction items. Should I talk about that? Oh, now? yeah, please do. Please talk about some of the auction yeah. items. So, we have an auction that's actually online right now, um, and you can find the link to the auction on our website, heritagesociety.org. But I just wanted to share with you we have we're going to have some art, we're going to have some jewelry, those are the standard things, right? But we also have a dove hunt in Argentina. Uh, we have an Acapulco trip that sleeps 14 people for six wow. nights. Oh, my so goodness. take all your friends. And then we have a long weekend in Belize. I've never been to Belize. Have you ever been to Belize? I've never been to Belize. So some fun trips that are part yeah. of the packages. All wonderful. And we have some exotic skin boots, a certificate to get exotic skin boots from our public boot company. They do a great job. Yeah. And then we have, of course, fun things to do around Houston. The you know We've got the Herman Park uh, Conservancy. We've got the Alley Theater, oh, great. so all kinds of exciting things. So it's going to be a really fun party. I hope you'll join us, and you can find more about it on our website. Yeah, HeritageSociety.org, HeritageSociety.org. And we also, by the way, have a couple of bus packages with the Houston History Bus. Oh, of course. Mr. Yes. Kenny was gracious enough to donate, is it three or four? Four, four total tours. packages, uh, yeah. downtown tour, Heights tour, and then we're also doing Mr. McKinney's Haunted Houston. We never offer this for silent auctions, only That's for right. the Heritage Society. Yes. Uh, so it's an opportunity to come get on board the bus in October to come learn about historic and haunted Houston. And like I said, this sells out every year, so it's a really tight ticket, but you get to come join us when you make a great, generous donation to the Heritage Society. And of course, all the money goes to fund the work that we do here. Yes. As you can imagine, having 10 historic structures on property, it gets to be expensive. Uh, the city of Houston doesn't fund the houses like most people think. Uh, yes. That's the responsibility of the Heritage Society, part of our mission. Okay. That's right. So when people contribute, you're also promoting Houston's history and preserving it and allowing us to teach young people and right. adults about the history of Houston's past. Well, what else is going on speaking of our past? Uh, well, we have, and I know I talk about this a lot, uh, let's see, our women's exhibit that uh, we've been talking about for a while, the suffrage exhibit celebrating the 19th Amendment. And it, that exhibit is going to end at the end of May. So I thought it would be fun, a fun gift for you to bring your Mother's Day people down to come see us on Mother's Day or the Saturday before. Um, and that would be a fun thing to do with your mom because I think it's going to be a pretty weekend from what I hear. You know, I think it's going to be a great weekend, but also, too, something else is coming up in June that connects with oh. our history. Talk about that fun event. Okay, so our Founders Day um, is June 4th. We were founded in June 4th, 1954, and our first house was the one and only Kellum Noble House, and we had a little ticket office over there. And so we uh, are going to celebrate our 67th year mm -hmm. uh, over at the Kellum Noble House, and Mr. McKinney's offering bus rides that evening. Yeah. And if you pay $19, you can come and have drinks and refreshments and the party, but if you pay $54, get it 1954, you can go on the bus. That's right, so, a VIP bus tour leaving from the Kellum Noble House, yeah. taking you on a one out on a, a 45 minute experience yeah. and then bringing you back to enjoy the festivities as well. There's going to be refreshments there, there's going to be food there, and then of course if you haven't had a chance to check out the newly renovated right. 1847 Kellum Noble House, Houston's oldest house on its original site, 
here in our area, I think it's going to be a great evening. And, and of course, we get to celebrate and honor uh, our, founders our founders and the idea of us being here for 67 plus years. So there you go. Make yeah. sure you come join I us for you'll that. Join us and you'll find out more about that on our website, too. Yeah. Well, thank you, Allison. Thank Thanks so much you. for joining Thanks us. For always having us. Absolutely. There you go. Again, heritage.org is the website. We're going to take it over here and get excited because we have with us a very special guest I mentioned earlier, uh, but I'm going to go over some more items and get people excited about what else is happening here at the Heritage Society. Okay. I want to make sure we thank Neil Parker, by the way. Neil Parker joined us last month as our special guest. We talked about the old Sixth Ward. So thank you to Neil Parker for doing that. And if you didn't get a chance to check out that video, it's available on our YouTube channel, which I'll talk about in a second. Also, Justice Ken Wise is our guest speaker that we had in March. Uh, so we appreciate him doing that. We kick off our season every year in March, which we'll do again. It goes from uh, up until November. We also have with us, like I said, lots of great guests. Robert Sackowitz, he was in the show a couple of uh, you know months ago as well. These are all available on the YouTube channel. Uh, once again, it's the Heritage Society's YouTube channel. Go ahead and like and subscribe this YouTube channel. It means a lot to us. It's a way for us to spread local history. There you go. Great videos, including videos on, uh, on African-American history, on architecture, on tours that we offer, and, of course, the homes that we have here as well. All right, what else is available? Say the date, because... Our next show is Wednesday, June 2nd, 7 o'clock at the Heritage Society, Wednesday, June 2nd, and we're going to have with us a very special guest, art historian Randy Tibbetts is joining us to talk about Houston's LGBT history through arts and artists happening in the 1930s, 40s, and early times, so you don't want to miss this show because you will learn a lot about local artists and local history on the live show we have here at the Heritage Society. Uh, thank you, by the way, to our new sponsor, Dirty Tonys, Dirty Tonys, Premium Queen Olives, Dirty Tonys. Make sure you go to dirty-tonys.com uh, to get more information on what they do. We do appreciate them sponsoring and supporting the show. Once again, Dirty Tonys. It's a local Houston company, been around for over 35 years here in our area. Once again, Dirty Tonys, women-owned business. So go support them and learn more about them at dirty-tonys.com. All right. I want to invite you to like and follow our social media sites, Mr. McKinney's Historic Houston and the Houston History Bus. I know lots of y'all are doing that right now, which we greatly appreciate. That's how you're learning about local history, by liking and following our social media sites. I had the pleasure earlier today to speak at the Crew Houston Women's Organization. It's Women in Real Estate, uh, and it was a great event. Uh, first time in person. We had about 100 people there spread out distance at the Junior League. A lot of fun, and we talked about Houston women's real estate history that day. So that was pretty great. Like and follow our sites to get a free ride on board the Houston History Bus. We'd love to have you come join us. Uh, we do tours year round, including the summer months. We just go out in the evening for summer months. So we appreciate that. And of course, there's the bus. There's the kids that we serve. So thank you so much for joining us by liking and following our page. If you do want to get on board the bus, the best way is to text us. Text 713-364-8674. 713-364-8674. Get you directly to our text message and uh, we'll give you information about the bus. All right. Here's our sites again. Now, we want to go ahead and welcome to the show. Um, he is a professor at Texas Southern University since 2009. He is also active with Houston's uh, Hispanic community, Latino community here in the area, serving on multiple boards and commissions. And he is our guest speaker for today. Please welcome Professor Dr. Jesse Esparza. Come on out. There he is. Oh, hello. Check it out. Uh, nice How to you see doing, you, sir? Appreciate good to you. see you. There you go. It's good to be here. An honor to have you because you're well, going to give us. You're going to take us on a journey through Houston's past, through Houston's Hispanic and Mexican culture past. Let's talk about that, by the way. Tell people what we're going to talk about tonight. Yeah, and so what I intend to do is I, you know, I I want to provide a history, a brief history, a detailed but brief history of the Mexican American experience in Houston, and uh, we'll see if we can get to the most present time. Uh, but uh, yeah, and, and this will not be a definitive history. At the end of my talk and at the end of our presentation, uh, we'll have a slide uh, of readings that I recommend for your viewers and your listeners so that they can go and explore further uh, the history of Mexican Americans in Houston. There's too much history to cover in the 40, 45 minutes that we intend to do. Uh, but we will give it the old college try, as they say. That's what they say. Well, excellent. Well, let's let's start at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. And so, okay, so, you know, the, the history of Mexican Americans go back uh, over a century. And uh, there were ethnic Mexicans in the Houston area since the 1830s and the 1840s. 
moving forward uh, after the 1900s, the population began to grow. And it began to grow at a slow pace, but grow nevertheless. And it did so for a variety of reasons. It did so because Houston uh, had industry that was attracting individuals. Certainly, many persons uh, uh, were fleeing uh, violence in Mexico, and so that would uh, generate a move into the Houston area. And Mexican Americans would come to settle really uh, in every ward of, of the city. Uh, we tend to think of the second ward as being the area where Mexican Americans lived, uh, and certainly that was the region where they mostly occupied, but not exclusively. Mexican Americans, uh, we are informed by uh, historian Arnoldo de Leon, who I think wrote the definitive history on uh, Mexican Americans in Houston, that uh, this population, this community lived uh, everywhere, uh, out, even outside the second ward. They lived in every ward. They lived further out east in Magnolia Park. Uh, they lived even in uh, what we understand today as the Upper North Side, and also, you can go to the next slide, the Upper North Side, and then certainly also in the Heights. We know that in about 1900, 1910, there was about 100 Mexican-American families who lived in the Heights, and typically they lived in the, in the neighborhoods where it was close to work for them. The, the industry. The too, industry yeah. pulled them, yeah, absolutely. And so, uh, you can go to the next slide. And, and when you think about occupation of Mexican-Americans, the great majority of Mexican-Americans were working class for a variety of reasons they were working class. And so many of them often uh, worked in what we consider service labor and labor in industries and those kinds of things. But what you have very early on is you have a very growing, uh, a small but growing uh, class of white-collar workers, teachers, uh, working in banks and those kinds of places. And certainly you have a growing entrepreneur class uh, that is emerging throughout the city. Here, for example, you have the Alamo Furniture Company. Uh, this would be uh, a business that is f uh, founded by Francisco Hernandez. Uh, and, uh, you know, this sort of speaks to the Mexican-American purchasing power that would exist in the city. Next slide, please. Here you have the bookstore uh, uh, managed by the brothers, the, the, the Sarabia brothers, Jose and Socorro. Uh, and here they, you know, this, this sort of, this image, you know, sort of, it, it speaks a lot because this tells you that these gentlemen are selling literature and books and those kinds of things, and so that you have a growing readership population. I mean, there's, it suggests a, a literacy among ethnic Mexicans who historically have been segregated and secluded and excluded uh, from the schools. You also have the emergence of Spanish language newspapers. Uh, La, La Tribuna, for example, El Tecolote, which is Spanish for the owl. Uh, La Gaceta Mexicana, which many of your viewers would, would know for oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, and again, th this, these newspapers shared information, uh, provided news, uh, helped organize people, and again suggested a literate population, a literate readership. Here you have La Consitida, 1930, this cafe, uh, Melesio Gomez, uh, and, and, and this, is, this looks like uh, this might be uh, you know, a family reunion of some sort, but uh, you know, cuisine, Latino cuisine, Mexican-American cuisine, ethnic Mexican cuisine would be very popular very early on in, in, in Houston and certainly restaurants galore throughout the city. They would come and go. But these are typically some of the better uh, la or longer lasting businesses and entrepreneurial enterprises that the city would see uh, from the Mexican-American community. Everyone loves ethnic Mexican food. Oh, absolutely. Here you have the uh, 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 El, El, El Azteca Teatro, the, the, the first Spanish language theater in Houston. Uh, and uh, here you, they would, uh, people would dress up fancy and they would come out and give them a space to socialize, give them a space to, to organize, give them a space to perhaps escape the hardships and the realities of, of daily struggles and daily lives. And think about the wherewithal of someone having to take that picture. They understood that this was a significant moment. That was probably opening night of some sort. Mm -hmm. And this is on, on Congress Avenue. That's it's right correct. there in, in what we think of as, it's been lovingly called Little Mexico. It's where a lot of businesses, Saravia family, for example, had the newspaper. The Azteca Theater as well as part of their 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 um, their empire, but yeah. uh, but this is really great to be able to see that, like you said, you know it, it was it was an occasion. People dressed up. Absolutely, you know? it was. Uh, Mexican Americans would also form several uh, competitive sports teams. Here you have, for example, in the slide, the Houston soccer team, circa 1927, and this would not be the only uh, athletic club. They, they were, there would be several athletic clubs, El Club Deportivo Azteca, the Mexican and baseball team, and typically a lot of these uh, sports clubs were funded and sponsored and managed by an employer of some sort. It was typically the workers of a company, of an organization that did this, 
uh, and they would compete with other teams, and, and this was a good way, again, to build camaraderie, and, and, and seemingly these were done because ethnic Mexicans, because of Jim Crow laws, because of segregation as laws, they would not be allowed to join in other groups and other clubs, and so they'd form their own, and that's part of that pioneering spirit of doing for themselves, becoming self-sufficient, self-reliant, establishing their own businesses, putting money in their own communities, uh, maintaining their own organizations, and that's all part of the same, uh, the same uh, effort here on the part of Mexican Americans. Certainly Mexican Americans would organize, and this is very important, some of the earliest organizations that would emerge in the city are mutual aid societies. You have, for example, the Mutalista Benito Juarez, uh, in Pasadena, you have the, the Mutual Aid Society in Miguel Hidalgo. Uh, and these Mutual Aid Societies uh, prove very effective for providing resources and support for the Mexican-American population who often struggled, oftentimes with uh, even being able to afford uh, services for funeral uh, arrangements and those kinds of things. And these Mutual Aid Societies often held drives. Uh, they raised money. They donated uh, uh, funds to help offset costs for these families. Uh, and then certainly you have political organizations as well, like, like Asamblea Mexicana, a very early active political organization that's trying to get Mexican Americans to flex their political muscle, who have a history of being disenfranchised, who have a history of having to pay high poll taxes and those kinds of things. And so there is a, ch a, a change in consciousness that is emerging early in the 1900s in Houston in the Mexican American community. Here's an example of another mutual aid society, El Campo Laurel. Uh, and you can see that it's mostly men, and these, most of these organizations would be men, but certainly not exclusive uh, uh, to assisting men. And women would also then make inroads in many of these organizations. For example, in 1931, Mexican-American women would found El Club Femenino Chapultepec, uh, and uh, this becomes one of the earliest all-female, all-Mexican-American uh, organizations, and they did a lot of things. Certainly, they uh, tried to improve the condition and the status of women throughout the city. Religious institutions become very important uh, very quickly in Houston. One of the earliest uh, religious organizations that would, that would form in the city is Our Lady of Guadalupe Church, established circa 1911. Uh, and this would be uh, a, a, a church where Mexican Americans in their neighborhoods in the Second Ward would go and frequent and attend mass in, in English or in Spanish or in bilingual masses. Uh, they would open up their own schools and in a period, where, again, where Mexican Americans struggled in traditional uh, school districts here, this was an alternative uh, for them to avoid segregation or avoid being tracked and placed in remedial courses and those kinds of things. You also have the Immaculate Heart of Mary Catholic Church established in the 1920s. And both of these churches really would do more than cater to the spiritual needs of the Mexican-American community. What they do also is they would really sort of provide a, a, a very sort of holistic and nurturing approach uh, for Mexican-Americans with food drives and clothing drives, relief during natural disasters, floods, and those kinds of things. And, and, and not only Catholic churches, right? I mean, you only, we only talked about these two, but there are certainly uh, 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 sort of uh, non-denominational uh, Catholic churches. Mexican-Americans are Baptists and, and, and they're Presbyterians and so forth, and they would do the same thing as well. Moving into the 1930s, the 1930s would be a very sort of uh, strange and struggling decade for Mexican-Americans. The Depression is on, and Houston is, is suffering. Uh, most Houstonians would. Uh, many of, uh, people across the nation would, indeed. Uh, and Mexican-Americans would struggle uh, uh, as well. Uh, and additionally, they would also then become victims of uh, staunch uh, forms of nativism. Uh, and anti-immigrationism, sort of anti-immigrant immigrant sentiment. Uh, and uh, what would happen is uh, that Mexican-Americans would be victims of these organized, sort of government-sponsored, sponsored, government-orchestrated roundups and deportations. And while there are difficult numbers, uh, you know, there's sort of debate on what the numbers look like, uh, the numbers were high. Well, I, mean, I, you, I, I had the pleasure of interviewing Gracie Sides, who's mm -hmm. active in Lula Council 60, a former city council member, uh, the first Latina elected to an at-large position in Mayor Pro Tem. And her father was born in Houston, Texas, yeah. and he was rounded up yeah. and taken to Mexico yeah. during this time period. Yeah. Uh, and then he made his way back. No, uh, you know, and uh, it's just it's an absolute tragedy, but it's an example. This hits home for lots of folks a in Houston. Absolutely, you're absolutely right, and, and because that's what I was going to say next. The tragic, I mean, there's there's sort of several tragedies. One is the separation of families, but two, a lot of these persons who would be removed out of the city would be citizens of the United States in many cases. Uh, as we enter into the 1940s and as we enter into the Second World War, the, the war and our entry into the war is going to do several things. For starters, it's going to help us ease up out of the Depression. 
uh, with the emergence of new industry, working in factories and warehouses, and Mexican Americans begin to find jobs like never before, as do other Americans during this period. And then during the war as well, uh, Mexican Americans would answer the call like Americans of the period would. And uh, there's anywhere between 300,000 to 500,000, about half a million is what most experts say uh, was the number of Mexican Americans who enlisted. And they served in every branch of the U.S. Armed Forces. Uh, the first picture that you saw, if you can go back, Ms. McKinney, this is the first uh, Mexican American casualty of war, uh, Joe Padilla from the north side. Uh, and he was serving in the Navy when he lost his life. Uh, and then we, in 2015, if you can go to the next slide, in 2015, I had the privilege and the honor to partner up with our good friend, Mika Selly, oh, over yes. at the Houston Metropolitan Research Center. Really? We conducted an oral history project where we spoke to vet veterans of, of this war, Mexican-American veterans of this war. And this is one of them. This is Marcos Varelas, who was uh, of private first class in the U.S. Army uh, and who was a part of Merrill's Marauders. He volunteered for one of the toughest gigs of the campaign. And... Uh, he would be uh, in, uh, fighting along the Burma Road. And so we spoke to Marcos Barelas. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Yeah. We spoke to Jesse Reyes. Jesse Reyes uh, was a, a sergeant in the U.S. Army. He was also a Holocaust liberator. He would help liberate, uh, after his fighting in, in Central Europe, he would help liberate a sub, uh, a sub concentration camp uh, 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 known as the Cow. Uh, and he gave a very vivid description of what that was like, how the, the gates swung open and people began to pour out. And he asked himself, how are they walking? He couldn't believe how these individuals were walking, and he was talking about Holocaust survivors. Wow. We spoke to Joe Silva. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Efren Serda, who was wheelchair-bound wheelchair uh, and who was in the Second World War. Then when we entered into the Korean War, he's there as well, so he was sort of served twice. Uh, we spoke to, you can go to the next slide, we spoke to Johnny Marino. John Marino was also a Holocaust liberator. Uh, he was uh, part of the D-Day uh, invasion. He fought at the Battle of the Bulge. These are major significant battles and turning battles, turning tide battles of the war. And he, too, would help uh, uh, liberate some of the concentration camps uh, over at uh, Hadamar. Uh, and John Marino, uh, we spoke to him uh, maybe about six or seven months before he passed away. And, and this is what's happening with our veterans. Is the men that I showed you, oh, yeah. they're, they're passing away. And, and, and so we were blessed. 90s, yeah, they they're were in the 80s and 90s when we spoke to them. And we oh, were blessed to, to get their story. There's David Loredo, who invited us several times. You can go to the next slide. Vincent Moreno, who was also uh, fought uh, in the Burma Road. Uh, he fought in the jungles of Tibet and Calcutta and places like that. Uh, Pat Patricio Tunches, who, who, who was, was another brave soldier. And so the Mexican-American community, uh, definitely Raymond Sanchez, was definitely contributing and definitely participating in every branch of the U.S. Uh, military. There's John Castillo, Ernest Aguilla. He's very famous. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And he's got generations who are, you know, who sort of uh, yeah. before and after. They're active like uh, council uh, Absolutely, absolutely. The yeah. There's Macario Garcia, uh, who I think your, your viewers know. Uh, Macario Garcia, as, as most of us know, is a Medal of Honor recipient uh, from the war, from his uh, encounters uh, in Europe. And he would be given the, uh, the Medal of Honor. And Mexican-Americans, proportionally speaking, uh, sort of have the highest number of awards and distinctions that would be awarded to them over any other ethno-racial group. Uh, and Macario Garcia is definitely one of them. The tragic about this is that Macario Garcia, when he would turn home, uh, he would be denied services in an eatery, uh, and most likely because uh, he was ethnic Mexican. He's actually a Mexican national and not a Mexican American. Mm -hmm. uh, he'd be the first Mexican national to receive a gold medal of honor. And then the story afterward would, that he would be denied services. And this was a tragic for many of these returning veteranos and veterans who would come home after helping defend democracy abroad. They would come home and sort of find the same kinds of forms of discrimination that existed in their communities before they left. Now, we spoke to mostly men. Uh, Mika Selly and I did. Uh, but we also spoke to women, and this is Felicitas Flores. Felicitas Flores was a corporal in the U.S. Army, and she was a part of what we call WAC, uh, the Women's Auxiliary Army Corps, uh, or excuse me, the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps. And they, women and Mexican-American women and all kinds of women, contributed in several kinds of ways uh, on the home front toward the war, but they also contributed by serving in several branches of, of the military, for the Army, for the Navy, for the Air Force, in these Women Auxiliary Corps, for example. Now, after the war, uh, the economy would thrive, would continue to thrive, and certainly Mexican-Americans uh, would benefit from that. And what you'll see is you'll see a proliferation of, 
uh, new businesses and new entrepreneurial enterprises that begin to emerge. And so, for example, here is a photo of, of the radio station KLVN, the first Spanish language radio station that would emerge in, in Houston. Uh, and so uh, this would be the brainchild of Felix and uh, Angelina Morales. That is not Felix in the picture there. That is Carlos Conde, who was one of the announcers and radio personalities. Uh, and uh, later, the son, I think, would manage, Joe Morales would manage the radio station. And certainly, there would be a slew of DJs that would go through and, and help uh, manage the radio station, like Jorge Rodriguez, and for example. And this was a very important institution uh, because it's speaking to a bilingual audience, a Spanish audience. It's spreading information. It's helping to organize. It's doing raffles, sort of like the Heritage yeah. Society. It's holding raffles, raising funds. Pr raising funds, bringing relief. And these are the kinds of institutions that give presence. Uh, media presence, and that would that would be a, this would be a, sort of the uh, the gateway to mainstream media for Latinos in many ways. And here's a fun fact too. Oh, a really fun fact. It is May 5th, right? The radio station goes on the air May 5th, 1950. It is 71 years old today. It would have been. It is, and it's still around through a different yeah. form. It's a religious uh, station right now. Yeah. But KLVL, La Voz Latina, uh, you know, was uh, the brainchild of, of, like you said, Angela and Felix Morales, and he actually applied for the license before World War One, and then the war got in the way, and they ended up giving to them. So it would have been earlier than 1950, I believe, had it all worked out. But uh, we're lucky to have them. And one of their most famous shows, is, as we all know, is the Yo Necesito Trabajo. Yeah. And the great thing about that radio program, it was the modern day, you know, a, a way to get a job back then. Yeah. Uh, somebody would call the radio station and say, I'm, a, I'm building a house. I need, you know, some plumbers. And they would go on the air and say, you know, we, we need some plumbers and contact this guy and just connecting and networking. So yeah. as you mentioned earlier, the radio station was vital to that community, you know, at the time. Absolutely it was. Uh, and, you know, actually Morales would be in Houston very early. Uh, he, he's originally from San Marcos mm -hmm. or someplace like 30s, that. Yeah, like and, and he would come to Houston in the 1930s and he would already, him and his wife would already establish businesses. They would have the Morales funeral home. And that's very important because, uh, you know, that also served as an institution that catered specifically to Mexican-Americans who also still struggled with trying to bury. I mean, they can turn to the churches, but when they didn't turn to the church, they turned to entrepreneurs such as the Moraleses to help care for their loved ones, uh, in, in, you know, once they pass and, and things like and that. And they gave back, too. I mean, the philanthropy aspect Absolutely. of it as well was really important, giving, giving financially back to the community. And they still do today with the... Uh, Morales uh, Family Foundation is still very active with uh, state representative Christina Morales. Christina Morales, yeah. Yeah, who's featured on our mural and was one of the co-chairs of that mural project with Orlando Sanchez uh, many years ago. So we're excited to, be able to have that mural on property. And I encourage you to go to the Heritage Society's website, heritagesociety.org, for information about the mural and uh, even go to YouTube and see some great videos at the Heritage Society's YouTube page. Also happening after the war is, you know, you will see a, rejuven a rejuvenation of civil rights organizations. So one of the earliest uh, organizations to emerge in Houston would be a LULAC, uh, the League of United Latin American Citizens. And LULAC Council Number 60 is the first LULAC organization to emerge. And it would have sort of, it would come and go. It would, very, it would be active since its, since its foundation. Uh, um, I mean, they were founded in 1929 in Corpus Christi. The very next year, just a couple of months later, in, 19, in 1930, they would launch what, is, what becomes the state's first desegregation case, the Jesus Salvatierra case out of Del Rio, Texas. And since that time, they had been agitating to destroy segregation wherever it exists. And after the war, LULAC would see a rejuvenation, and its membership would grow, and its activism would expand uh, beyond the neighborhoods, and so you Which have is perfect timing for the civil absolutely. rights that we have coming absolutely. Up in, in fact, right, we rights. often call these we often call uh, members of LULAC and other organizations like it. We call them the GI generation. These are yeah. the activists who would come and really amplify civil rights activism and protection like never before. Lawyers like John Herrera. These are established persons. These are uh, uh, well-rounded individuals who fight, uh, uh, you know, and they beg, borrow, and steal to 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 fund these cases and to battle for civil rights. Mexican kids Americans. Doing it in the 1960s, or kids, and all of a sudden it's now absolutely part of it. It becomes a gathering space for the community yeah. uh, and things of that nature. So, so, so you'll have LULAC. We'll have the Houston. Houston would have its own chapter of the American GI Forum. Another organization founded by veteranos of, of World War II. This is Dr. Hector Hector P. Garcia, who was a veteran of the Second World War. Oh, he served as a medic in the war, and when he returned home, he founded this organization. Now, the American GI Forum was initially founded to provide Mexican American veterans services that they had earned through the VA, the, the Veterans Administration, but that they were not getting for a variety of reasons. 
Well, so this organization was organized to ensure that they received those things, but then very quickly it becomes an organization that also, like LULAC, begins to challenge uh, voter discrimination, uh, segregation where it exists. Uh, this organization will expand throughout Texas. Houston will have one of the largest chapters and it would have one of the most viable chapters uh, moving forward. You also have musical talent that is emerging pre-war and after war, certainly. Uh, you have groups like the Tommy Flores Orquesta, Alonso y sus Rancheros, certainly Lady Mendoza, who's been performing since the oh, 1930s. Yeah. You have the Centeno family, Roberto Centeno, uh, uh, Cecilio Rodriguez, the, the Roberto Compian band. And, you know, this musical talent that sort of speaks to the creativity on the part of Mexican Americans who, are, again, are finding ways to survive and thrive in what are often hostile conditions and hostile situations. And they become and they begin to uh, leave an impression in music and in art in Houston in many ways, this musical talent does. Here you have Eloy Perez and the Latin Airs uh, at the Pan American Nightclub. Uh, and, and Mr. McKinney, you have to correct me. Uh, you know, is, is night spelled, the, is that how they spelled nightclub? Well, I, yeah, well, it looks like that's how they did it. That is how they spelled nightclub in, in, a, no. leader in, in a sense of that nature. Um, and, the, and the Pan American Ballroom, of course, on North Main, right across from Papa Burger. I mean, it was a big deal. Uh, it sadly was demolished uh, yeah. to make uh, room for a, a, a parking lot. Uh, and, uh, and, but it was, it was a, the hot spot. I mean, people went there, and there's still some nightclubs that are still around, uh, you know, the, the White Swan, for example, yeah. you know, in the East End. Um, but, uh, but these bands also, you go back to uh, Roberto Compion, I mean, they're playing at the Shamrock Hotel. You know, they're, they're headlining, you know, at, uh, at, at the Montague. I mean, they're, they're playing some really big spaces uh, that they're integrating their culture, their music with the, uh, you know, appreciative Caucasian community that is now learning more about and tolerating more and just kind of. Yeah. So they're, they're, the arts are going to always have a fine way of breaking down these barriers. So Yeah, and, and, and I'm glad you said that because that was my sort of my next segue is that these, spa these, these, these dance, these ballrooms and these nightclubs and these musical talents, they sort of become spaces where people can sort of move back from those staunch lines that often divide and separate people. And at least for a moment, uh, persons are able to come in and share uh, uh, the love of music and the love of dancing and camaraderie. And then after which, they probably go back to sort of hating one another out in the, out in the community. And then as we move into the 1960s, uh, Houston, like many other cities throughout the nation, are going to explode with an amplified uh, and robust uh, civil rights activism that would be led and charged mostly by youth, young Mexican Americans who are identifying themselves as Chicanas and Chicanos uh, and who are, for the most part, distancing themselves and separating themselves from the efforts and the methods of their parents and of their elders who would use, uh, who would use the, for example, the court cases and who would have money to use, uh, to use litigation to com combat change. These are young people, these are college kids, and these are students and who don't have money and who don't have the patience to wait that long for a court case, a court case to roll out. So they march through the streets and they hold rallies and protests, sit-ins and walkouts, and they occupy buildings and they occupy spaces, and then they hold massive conferences like this. La Conferencia de Mujeres por la Raza uh, held here uh, May 28th through May 30th. Uh, uh, then this was a conference called by women who were like other Chicanas and Chicanos of the period, uh, sort of pointing out that there is there are elements that that oppress them there is racism uh, and, and those kinds of things but quite honestly they were also calling out the sexism that would exist within the civil rights movement and the Chicano movement uh, and so they were also sort of putting Chicano men on notice and say hey look you know you we are not your supporters we are not your secretaries and those kinds of things and so here you have another organization that would emerge and that that would thrive in Houston the Mexican American Youth Organization or Mayo Mayo would be founded in South Texas, but very quickly it would become a chapter, an organization that would chapter throughout the state. And as historian Armando Navarro tells us, this is the avant-garde of civil rights organizations during the Chicano movement in Texas. Uh, and in Houston, you know, funny thing is, Houston actually had two Mayo organizations, one that formed on the campus of the University of Houston, the main campus, and one that they called uh, Barrio Mayo. Ah. Uh, and so I don't know what's happening there, yeah. the strange dynamic, uh, but uh, it was an organization nevertheless that, was, that used confrontation uh, as a way to implement change, they would storm uh, school board meetings, they would, uh, uh, what is it called, they shout somebody out when they're trying to speak and those mm -hmm. kinds of things. And Miles certainly would uh, be involved in several tenets of the Chicano movement, whether it be anti-war, anti-poverty, anti-segregation, and Miles really made a name for itself in Houston. 
Here, this is a picture of Jose Torres, who was the principal at uh, what is known as a huelga school, a strike school. Uh, in 1971, uh, the, an organization known as the Mexican American uh, Education Council would launch a strike against the Houston Independent School District for its failure to uh, integrate fully. Uh, this is after 1954. The Supreme Court case in Brown had been decided, and integration is, is now deemed unconstitutional. But since 1954, school districts across the nation, and certainly here in Houston, found ways to circumvent that law. And they did, they did several things. One of the things that they did is they took advantage of the legal classification of Mexican Americans as Caucasian. Uh, and so using that legal classification, what they did is they paired Mexican American students with African American students, and then they called that integration. And this organization and these parents, they said, no, that is not real integration. You are leaving the wealthy schools untouched. We are continuing to send our kids to poor, underfunded schools, and we're going to strike. And HISD did not believe that. So this organization struck, and they struck for about two weeks. And in that time that they struck, uh, they formed these huelga schools or these strike schools in where they got teachers and administrators to come and educate these kids so that they wouldn't fall behind once the strike was over they can kind of just still be on track and then they would get people to come cook breakfast and lunch and those kinds of things and this is just another testament of the uh, creativity yeah. yeah the creativity on the part of these activists to really really destroy these 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 institutions that that that, that oppressed them and, and that have oppressed them for, for decades. And they were. They, they had to bus kids. They were actually busing kids from all over the city back and forth to meet those quotas, including some, some families I talked to woke up at 6 in the morning and 4 in the morning yeah. to get their kids ready for school. And that was when enough was enough, just having to go all across town, making no sense when a school was just down the street, yeah. just to reach that quota. So uh, it just in an effort to really uh, block uh, the integration program. So, um, so let's talk about... Uh, yeah, the, the other thing that's happening simultaneously, I don't want to give the impression that LULEC and the American GI Forum, that those kinds of organizations go away because they do not. They continue to maintain the course, and in fact, they would be very instrumental, uh, as would other Mexican Americans, in helping expand the political muscle of Mexican Americans. And so, very quickly, these organizations and activists and Mexican Americans are actively campaigning for candidates of their choice, like for Henry B. Gonzalez, for example, uh, who would be a senator out of Texas, who in 1956 is going to filibuster for 22 hours straight uh, to try to get bills that were being that were being uh, uh, discussed on the floor that were go that was going to protect segregation. And Henry B. Gonzalez wanted no part of that, so he filibustered to get make sure that that didn't happen. And Mexican Americans are campaigning for him. They're campaigning for John F. Kennedy through these Viva Kennedy clubs, through the Viva Kennedy Johnson clubs, and then the Viva Johnson clubs. Uh, they're helping elect people like Armando Rodriguez to the municipal judge position in 1972. And they're certainly forming more powerful political organizations like the Civic Action Committee. And so the political muscle on the part of Mexican Americans, even after the war, is beginning to increase. The Chicano movement doesn't slow that down. In fact, the Chicano movement kind of intertwines with that somewhat and amplifies this growing political presence. Here's a picture of the Viva Kennedy Clubs. Uh, they would be very instrumental in getting uh, Kennedy uh, elected to the Oval Office. Uh, and certainly they would do the same uh, for Johnson, uh, to, who, his running mate, the Viva Kennedy slash Viva Johnson clubs. Another organization that would emerge during this period as part of the Chicano movement, but it would be an organization that uh, would function very much like a mainstream middle class civil rights organization, is the Political Association of Spanish-Speaking Organizations, or PASO. Uh, here's the Houston chapter. Here's a flyer of the Houston chapter. Uh, and in Houston, they, they, we had a headquarters here in Houston. And this organization, as I mentioned, would campaign, would help campaign, would help people get registered to vote. And then more than getting people registered to vote, Mexican Americans, they would also then initiate campaigns or the, the, sort of these, these, uh, these efforts to get them to the polls, right? Because one thing is getting them registered to vote. You do that at their house. The other thing is to get them to the poll site so they can go vote. And sometimes these are people who had to stand in line for, for hours to do so. But this would increase the voting power of Mexican Americans uh, in the city of Houston. And they would be responsible and play a role in, in the election of Ben Reyes, for example, who was state representative in 1972. Uh, also, they would be responsible for the election, them and many other Mexican Americans, for the election of Leonel Castillo as a city comptroller in 1972. Uh, and then, you know, Paso, because it was birthed during the Chicano movement, would also sort of have this drive for combating injustice, and it, it would have a very sort of social justice orientation to it as well. And here in 1966, uh, Basel would transport a lot of the, its activists 
to the valley, to South Texas, where they then would proceed on this massive pilgrimage in the march, as, you, as we know it today, the minimum wage march, in where they were agitating for labor rights. And it was a pilgrimage from the valley, from South Texas, all the way to Austin. Uh, and that's one of the largest and longest pilgrimages that, that I know of that would take place uh, in Texas. Also uh, emerging during this period and when we're sort of, sort of talking about the Chicano movement and how that blends with this growing political presence, we'd have the emergence of a new political organization, La, La Raza Unida Party, translates into the, United, the party of the United Race. Uh, and this is an organization that would be uh, uh, formed by Mexican Americans, by those who identified themselves as Chicanas and Chicanos. Uh, and really, right, they, the, the argument was that uh, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, both of those political or entities, did a disservice to Mexican Americans, and so that they needed their own organization in which they can really flex political muscle like never before. And they had some success at the local level. They would run people for school board and for city council and things like that. And, and they, they ran a, a candidate for the governorship two times, 1972 and 1974, uh, unsuccessfully, but nevertheless they would do so. And Houston would have a very sort of strong chapter of La Raza Unida Party. Uh, and so this fight for social justice uh, would, would, would sort of stay, it would stay the course in Mexican Americans into the 70s and into the 80s are, are anti-segregationists, are trying to destroy the efforts to, to uh, circumvent their vote. Certainly they are looking to end poverty, uh, to uh, create access to health care. And then the issue of police brutality in the late 1970s would take center stage. And you have what you have is what we know today as the Joe Campos Torres case. This would be a veteran of the Vietnam War, Jose Torres, who would be a victim of police brutality uh, in May of 1977, May 5th. Another, 19, anniversary, another anniversary, if you will, of, uh, of May 1977. And, um, uh, you know, from this, you have this massive fallout. Uh, it would be a year before uh, prosecution would, would take place for those responsible for his death. I mean, this was a, a veteran. This was a, a Mexican-American veteran. This was not someone who fought for the, for the nation. And uh, HPD, nevertheless, uh, was, uh, you know, sort of I implicated in his murder. And then uh, as a result of this... the outcome. Well, you know, the officers in question... Uh, initially, because there would be sort of several cases, at least two of them, uh, 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 suits, and uh, initially the, the officers in question received lenient sentences, mm -hmm. like a year probation, a $1 fine, uh, and this caused massive outrage throughout the community. And what's interesting about this is while this is often considered a situation for Mexican-Americans and the Mexican-American community, I want to make it known that you have a uh, multiracial coalition building that would take place as a result of this because police brutality afflicted other communities as well. And you would have white activists and African-American activists who would join uh, in arms with, uh, with Mexican-Americans to call police brutality for what it is. And again, right, we sort of live in our own period with the issue of police brutality, again, sort of coming full circle. This is a picture of the Moody Park riots. The result, uh, the result of the, 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 later, the yeah, yeah a, a year, almost a year to the day later, uh, would be this massive uh, riot that would take place uh, up at Moody Park, up in the north side, and uh, Mexican Americans who are, are unleashing their frustration, uh, they would go out and, and engage in a riot. Certainly, they'd be, uh, it'd be instigated, uh, and there's, there's mystery behind that, and there's debate behind that, uh, but uh, they'd be instigated, and, and nevertheless, it would result in a riot, millions of dollars of damages. Uh, people arrested, other people uh, indicted for exciting a riot, and, and nevertheless, it, it, it becomes a, a tragic scene. But activists uh, of all kinds would rally, and you would have, as I mentioned, this multiracial coalition building. But then you'll also have multi-generational coalition building because you'll have, like, the Ben Reyes's in them, and you'll have the Lulacs. They would come in support and stand in solidarity. While they disagreed with perhaps the, the, this the kind method of method, happened, yeah. this kind of method, they would nevertheless uh, uh, voice their concerns uh, about police brutality. Also happening as a result of the Chicano movement is you have, uh, again, as always, it seems every decade, newer and new artistic expressions. These expressions uh, represent uh, the, the, uh, this sort of renaissance of the Chicano movement. And while a lot of that sort of tells the history of Mexican-Americans, the story and the experiences of Mexican-Americans, they also speak to issues that plague the community, issues like racism and, and those kinds of things. And so uh, you have, uh, you know, a proliferation of sculpture and certainly literature. You can go to the next slide. Uh, murals and so forth that, that talk and highlight and, and really emphasize the pre-Columbian past, that is the, the past of Mexican-Americans prior to the arrival of Europeans in 1492. And so it, they, they pay homage 
damage to Mesoamerica and Mesoamerican societies like the Omic and the Mayan and the Inca and the, and the Aztec and the Toltec and so forth. Uh, and then they also sort of do these paintings and drawings and sketches that, again, speak to the issues of injustice. And here, right, is, is, the, is one, of the, the, you know, most, one of the most well-known murals uh, in the city, the rebirth of our nationality. Uh, commissioned in 1972, it took about, nine, it took about uh, maybe a year to do, I think. Uh, one of the directors of the program was Leo Tanguma, an artist of the period, and he worked with several artists, and they all worked together. It was a collective to paint this, what is it, Mr. McKinney, 240-foot-long mural that tells the story of Mexican-Americans, not just in Houston, but sort of the Mexican-American experience overall uh, throughout, throughout the nation. And it's been repainted by Gonzo 247 it, mural Exactly. It has, been, it has been restored, and if I, I guess that's the right term to use. It's been restored. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I mean, it, it it pops off of the wall, there. and there there was some there was some fear that uh, the building was going to be sold and then demolished, and the community put that yeah. to a stop. And they the really, county owns the building; it's a regular yeah. storage area. But uh, no, we're um, Gonzo two four seven, the mural artist, uh, actually uh, got Leo to come down from Colorado uh, to, to to be here for the ceremony, and it, he was very touched by this. Uh, we had him on the radio show and told a story about that, which you can get on kpft.org backslash archive. Uh, but it's absolutely an amazing piece of art that everybody benefits from. Yeah. And then you have other artists, certainly into, moving into the 1980s, uh, like Luis Jimenez, uh, who has this beautiful, it's, a, it's like a marble blue sculpture, yeah. the vaquero. Yeah, and, and so again, it's another proliferation and another explosion, and a renaissance as I call it, that would continue to take place even after the Chicano movement, when you sort of think about art uh, in Houston and the Mexican-American and making a presence in the art scene. And then you have places and spaces that uh, continue to push that artistic expression, uh, like Casa Ramirez and the Folk Art Gallery uh, and other kinds of places like that. Now, moving beyond the 1980s, through the 1980s and into the present, uh, or into the, t into, uh, the year 2000, uh, we have, again, another new political presence, Al Luna and uh, Raul Martinez, for example, become state representatives during this decade. You have now Mexican-Americans campaigning against each other and that's really, that doesn't happen often. But here now they're campaigning for each other for political positions and elected positions like John Castillo and Victor Trevino. Uh, and so you have a growing and, and still growing uh, Mexican-American political presence. You also have uh, Judge uh, Celia Garcia, who becomes the first Mexican-American woman judge uh, for the municipal courts uh, in 1987. There she is with my, uh, uh, Mayor, with, uh, former Mayor Whitmeyer. Um, um, uh, sort of yeah. being inducted. And, now, of course, Congresswoman. Exactly. Uh, U.S. Exactly. Congresswoman, state senator. Yeah. Here you have Agu Dr. Agustina Reyes, who was a faculty member at the University of Houston, uh, who was also a longtime activist and certainly would serve on the school uh, board for the Houston Independent School District. And so Dr. Reyes is making inroads there. You have Elma Barrera. Elma Barrera is, is a longtime TV reporter and media personality, and she would cover a lot of the history of the, of the Chicano movement in Houston, and certainly up until her retirement. Uh, and then you have other persons in mainstream media. This is mainstream media, uh, like Sylvan Rodriguez from 11 News. He was an anchorman. And then there's also Mario Gomez, who was a meteorologist also for 11 News. And so Mexican Americans are now establishing a presence in politics, establishing a presence in, in mainstream media, and are becoming a more visible uh, community and population, and it continues to be a hotbed of musical activity. Uh, you would have during this period, for example, the formation of Conjunto Festival. Uh, Ray Rodriguez and his colleagues would put on this beautiful, beautiful festival where they would showcase talent from across the city and across the state uh, and certainly across the nation, and even from Mexico. Uh, you would also have Festival Chicano, Daniel Bustamante, and his colleagues would do the same. Still doing uh, it, too. Still doing it, yeah, still he, doing he's, it. he's still, still doing it, that's right. Uh, and then you'll have talent like Esel Garcia, who was a Tejano recording artist, Sister Sister, or a, Houston, uh, a Houston talent. Uh, and then you have all other kinds of musical talent like uh, uh, Victor Nash, uh, Nick, Vic Nash, uh, Espinosa, uh, and so forth. So, so really the city continues to thrive uh, across all levels and really make a scene across all levels, including the music industry. Uh, and then also in the 1980s, uh, Houston would open its doors. And, and this, is, this is worth noting because Houston would open its doors to newcomers to persons who are leaving uh, Latin America, and, and by the 1980s, it would still be mostly, I mean, uh, from Mexico, but now mostly from other places outside of Mexico and Latin America, like Central America, and uh, it would open its doors and, to, and invite these refugees, and the sanctuary movement would begin in Houston, um, and uh, you would have organizations like Casa Juan Diego 
that would be very instrumental in providing services to these newcomers. Uh, you also have the Chicano family of Magnolia Park, Clinica Azteca, and Casa de Amigos Health Clinic, and they would be very instrumental in providing refuge and for, for these newcomers, and Mexican Americans would welcome them in many ways. Into the 21st century, the community is thriving, the community is growing. We, uh, at present, we're like, what, 2 point million, two, uh, two, at least 2 million, 2.7 million people, uh, Mexican Americans uh, presently, and here the number is growing exponentially. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, uh, th that the Latino population in Houston is exploding now, and, and mostly because of immigration from Central America. People are coming from Guatemala, and they're coming from other kinds of places. And Houston really has become one of the most popular destinations for Central Americans because of the, the size of the Latino population, because of the industry, uh, and 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 uh, that that flourishes here in Houston, and it's attracting. And and these Central Americans, when they come, uh, they come and like like Mexican Americans before them, and like other Americans before them, they come and they thrive, and they establish their own businesses, like the Mondongo Restaurant. Uh, and you'll have carnicerias galore, taquerias, restaurants of all kinds. And so there's Mondongos there. Uh, you'll have. Uh, go ahead. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Uh, you go to the next one, next one. You'll have uh, other businesses that would cater to the growing Latino population. Fiesta, Fiesta Mart, El Mercado, Plaza de Americas. It used to be a mall, and it was completely transformed. And La Michoacana, every time I get barbacoa, mm -hmm. Mr. McKinney, oh, yeah. I go to La Michoacana and get yeah. my barbacoa. And so it's all these businesses that are emerging and thriving as a result of the influx of new Latinos uh, who are coming and are really right. This, this also speaks to the purchasing power of the Latino community, the Mexican-American, and non-Mexican-American community in Houston. Which connects with this. Which, absolutely, we'll right? And you're bit, yeah. These are multi-million dollar organizations, businesses, Fortune 500 businesses, Univision, Telemundo, Azteca TV, uh, and they, again, are like the newspapers and like the radio stations. Uh, this media is speaking to a growing diverse population. It is speaking to a bilingual population, uh, and it's become a very, uh, these organizations become global in many ways, and this also speaks to the purchasing power and the CEO growing ship, right? The, you have a brotherhood of CEOs, Latino CEOs, who sort of run these kinds of multi-million dollar organizations. You know, you said it best, too, because I serve on the board of Mill Alfred theater for example and we when we want to reach to the latino community you have got to buy radio time yeah. and this is a community that still reads the newspaper still reads the periodicals still watches television in large numbers uh Gante, all the shows uh, the, the telenovelas, and then also of course listens to the radio in large numbers so if you want to reach that community in that market you got to go to the media. Go. it's still old-fashioned which is great because it's a way for you to reach out to them you know how to get a hold of them if you need to absolutely and certainly, right, Mexican-Americans and other Latinos enjoy the nightlife like everyone does. And uh, Amazonia Discotec would be one of the ones that, and, and you and know. You work hard. You want the weekend. Absolutely. Relax, you work you know, hard. You relax you hard. And, 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 um, and, 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 you know, you have a, a slew, too many to, to, to talk about now, but you have a slew of these discotheques and nightclubs and uh, dance halls and so forth. Club Tropicana would be another one. And certainly, right, you sort of think about cuisine, what that means for cuisine in Houston. Houston has always been a city rich in flavors uh, when you think about food. And certainly the arrival of uh, Latino newcomers are going to put a spin on Latin cuisine in many ways. You have Hugo's uh, uh, and you have other, you have Gloria's, for example. Gloria's. I saw Gloria's way over here. Oh, yeah. yeah. Hugo's Mexican restaurant, yeah. Ronald Richards, things like that. You know, these yeah. different regions. So, uh, you know, it just, it, it's, it, it grows. And certainly, right, with the arrival of the professional soccer team, and certainly Latinos aren't the only ones who support the Houston Dynamo, uh, and it isn't it's just that community that it's goes out. It's still a pastime, yeah. Absolutely, but this is, this is again, sort of the uh, responding to the needs and, 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 and catering to the purchasing power of the Latino community in Houston, 2 point million Latinos in Houston a day. And so certainly, I mean, we are like the fourth largest Latino city in the nation. Uh, and this is a testament to the arrival of the Houston Dynamo is a testament to the strength of the purchasing power of the Latino community today. Now, this slide is for your viewers here as well. I, you know, I, I put here a list of books that I would recommend for anyone who is interested in learning more uh, about the history because in the slide that I gave and the, the, slide that, the slides that we talked about, it's the tip of the iceberg is what I want you to know. Uh, and so I, I mentioned Arnoldo de Leon earlier. I talked about ethnicity in the Sun Belt. That is, I, I believe, the standard book that talks about the history, uh, the, the, the experiences of Mexican Americans. That's the book to, go, to start with. Um, and uh, you also have uh, my, my good friend and my advisor, Guadalupe San Miguel, mm -hmm. over at the University of Houston, who wrote a book uh, in uh, 2001 called Brown Not White. That's a book that deals with the integration movement during the Chicano movement here in Houston. Now, when I talk about the Huelga schools, uh, look at San Miguel's Brown Not White. 
Tom Krennic, who worked for a long time at the, the Houston Metropolitan Research yeah. Center. Yeah. yeah, that is uh, a great book about the early history. Absolutely, too. and it's a pictorial history of the Mexican-American experience. It's got beautiful images, and he used all the images that are in the archives. My recommendation is to get yourself across the street to the archives at the Houston Metropolitan Research well, Center. And something that just came out is the Del Pueblo book that is um, now, it, it's also, there's two versions of it. There's the pictorial book, yes, and then there's a larger, more detailed version, which just came out about maybe four years ago or so. And that's the one that I recommend. I don't think it's on there, but you definitely want to get both. Uh, and it has some pictures. And you referenced earlier uh, Mika Skelly over at the HMRC. Uh, you know, the collection of uh, photos are also available yeah. there for people to look at too. Yeah, it's great stuff. Absolutely. In fact, Mika Skelly is is one of the authors, one of the contributing authors for the next book. There, yeah. it was a book about baseball. Mexican American and baseball, and in Southeast Texas, and she would be a large part in helping produce that. And then, last but not least, uh, one of my earliest mentors. Uh, when I arrived to the city of Houston was uh, Dr. Lisel uh, Cano, uh, who, used, who teaches over at the Houston Community College at the Southeast Campus. Her and her colleague, James Ross Nassau, wrote a book called The Spirit of Magnolia Park, which documents a brief but full history of Magnolia Park, uh, and, and, and as you can see there, ethnic pride in the Mexican barrio. And so these are just a little bit of the readings that I recommend for your viewers and listeners. Here also I recommend uh, visiting archival centers that are here in Houston and that you can also do digitally that is online. The Houston Metropolitan Research Center right across the street as we mentioned. Mika Selly is a Hispanic collection archivist there. She's also the oral history librarian there uh, and she sits on what is a mountain of gold of history for Mexican Americans and in Houston. And we should say too, it, it's a call to action, um, you know, um, if you have old photos, if there are Latinos out there listening that we've not yet reached out to if I yeah. get a hold of, the worst thing that can happen is these photos just stay in a shoebox someplace, you know, saving the family. Let's get them out there so that Dr. Sparza can use them for his lectures when he can teach young people about the history of these communities as he does at TSU, and other people can as well. So just think about that. If you know folks that have old photos of Houston, uh, you can just donate the images. We can scan them in and give them back to you. But to be able to have them where the greater good and the public can learn from them is a definite gift and a blessing. So we want to encourage people to do that. Or if you know that maybe um, your kids or grandkids aren't going to take care of them or want them, well, hey, the library is the best place for them in that case. Yeah, I, I'm glad you said that. And I echo, the, I echo similar sentiments. Um, and if you don't do that, then I would also still call them and say, well, look, I got these records. I don't want to give them anywhere, but how do I preserve them? And they'll give you tips on yes. how you can make them, how you can make them last longer. But certainly I think that that is a, 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 I'm glad it's a wonderful suggestion because you want those, those kinds of records to exist for a thousand years, a thousand years from now. We want to know the history of your family, and that's going to contribute in many ways. There's also the Center for Mexican-American Studies over at the University of Houston, uh, initially run by uh, Tacho Mendiola, our good friend, and Lorenzo mm -hmm. Cano, now overseen by uh, Dr. Quiroz, who's the new director there. Uh, there's also online the Houston Area Digital Archives. There's also the Portal to Texas History. These are You can just Google those, and then you click on the links. There's the Voices Oral History Project, sponsored by, uh, the, or, or uh, over at the University of Texas, uh, sponsored by the School of Communications there. Uh, and then certainly uh, out of Texas Christian University, out of TCU, there's a Civil Rights and Black and Brown Oral History Projects. And, and I'm not trying to give Mika, our good friend, more uh -huh. word, but if anyone, any of your viewers and listeners are interested in sharing their stories, uh, I am willing to talk to anybody and, and conduct an oral history of anyone, and certainly that is a great way to, uh, to, to preserve this history yeah. and promote this history. Well, this has been great. So, Dr. Sparza, we now have five questions that you get to ask the audience. These are questions about the lecture we just heard a second ago. So uh, rest assured the answers will be in what we just talked about earlier. So let's talk about that. What's question number one? Yes. And again, we're going to answer it next week, but, uh, next month rather, but what is question number one? Yes, question number one. I, I had to write this down. I hope that's oh, okay. That's great. Perfect. So question number one is, what is the name of the first Spanish language theater in ah, Houston? Ah, that was a good okay. one. Do I repeat that question? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, what is the name of the first Spanish language theater in Houston? Okay. What is the name of the first Spanish language theater in Houston? We talked about it earlier. Okay. Second question. Second question. What is the name of the organization founded by Mexican American women in 1931? Ah. What is the name of the organization founded by Mexican American women in 1931? Okay. There you go. Third question. Third question. What is the name of the first Mexican American casualty of war during World War II? That's a great question. Say it again. What is the name of the first Mexican-American casualty of war during World War II? Okay. Our fourth question. Fourth question. What is the name of the women's conference held in Houston in 1971? What is the name 
of the Women's Conference held in Houston in 1971. Our fifth and final question. And the fifth and final question, name one of the organizations in Houston that aided refugees during the 1980s. Name one of the organizations in Houston that aided refugees during the 1980s. Houston, that's great. You've got some options there. I think people are chiming in now, which we appreciate. Lots of fun folks chiming in their answers. Lots of answers there, okay? So get in so we can give you prizes and talk about that on next month's show when we have Randy Tibbetts join us on June 2nd. Well, Dr. Sparza, thank you again for joining us on uh, the live show we have here at the Heritage Society. We're going to say thank you, and we're going to say thank you for tuning in as well. We'll see you next month, okay? Take I care. appreciate you. Thank you, everybody.